Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and apologies for the delayed start. But we thank you for your patience and it's a pleasure to host you this evening. For those who don't know me, I am Cloline Daly Mushet and the PSOJ Marketing and PR Manager, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. This is our second in our No, no Jab or No Job series, where the PSOJ, Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, and JMEA are just seeking to keep our members informed around workplace vaccine policies. We would have had our first session in September, and we heard the calls for the second session, and so we're here this evening and we thank you for joining us. Before we get into the, the, into the meat of the matter though, I just want to acknowledge a few persons who are here, starting with the president of the PSOJ, Mr. Keith Duncan. Thank you, Keith. Hi, uh, president of the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Lloyd Distant, vice president of the PSOJ, Mr. Jason Hensel, also from the Jake's Hotel. Uh, we have also with us attorney Conrad George, who would have been our, our, one of our main attorneys at the last session, as well as the executive director of the JCC, Mr. Larry Watson. I'm not sure if our ED is on yet. Amiga, if you're here, good evening. Oh, Amiga, yeah, wonderful. Here. Amiga Rees McNabb, the executive director of the PSOJ. Um, Today's session is also a joint session. So in addition to having our conversations around workplace policy, we have also merged this session with the private sector vaccine initiative standard monthly or bi-weekly updates that we have. And so I want to especially recognize the PSVI team, Safra Brown, who is the project coordinator. I'm not sure if Mr. Zaka is on yet. And Kalando Wilmoth, who is the head of com communications for the PSVI team. So without much further ado, thank you everyone for joining us. And Mr. Duncan, I'm gonna hand over it to you for the official welcome and opening remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Colleen. And thank you everyone for joining. And again, sorry for the, the late start. We we're trying to um, ensure that we had all the, those who were um, on the agenda on the agenda. Thanks for um, all the, those who have agreed to participate and, um, and lead sessions today, Jason, Conrad, um, I think um, Safri uh, and um, Lloyd, um, who has done a lot of work in terms of the coordination of the development of protocols, um, Lloyd Distant, that is. And, um, and um, I think we also have on the agenda um, Donna Duncan Scott from GMMB, um, who will be looking at, as um, Claudine, I hope you're able to tie her down. Yes. And, um, and um, and Jason, who will as um, in his role as um, hotelier, speak to um, the uti how he used the protocols um, to um, work through his vac vaccination um, strategy for Jake's, where he was able to get a hundred percent at the end of the day. But he will explain. No. Uh, overall context is and Conrad, thank you very much for being so supportive through this whole entire thing and taking the confusing calls from all the various parties, right? Including myself, right? Um, let me just start by saying, you know, where Jamaica is at this point in time. There's, there is a lot of, um, I would say, conflicting signal. There's a lot of noise in the, in the basic space in the ecosystem around vaccination and where we're, and where we're going as a country. We are probably maybe around between 12 and 13 percent of fully vaccinated, and maybe somewhere around 20 odd percent, 20 small percent, um, you know, total jabs. And um, working towards targets, we have heard of a million, and working towards uh, some threshold targets of 50 percent, and um, all various, and working towards um, and the and the word of mandate, which which really um causes really concerns for people because it means, you know, something to do with their right as a human being, mandate versus your right. And, you know, a high degree of hesitancy, maybe because of how communication was handled from the beginning. Um, but, you know, there, the facts are is that we have a high degree of hesitancy um, and people are resistant and um, across um, in, in, in a significant level of um, hesitancy in Jamaica. 
Now, how do we get to the place where we need to be? And the original target set by the government of Jamaica of about approximately 2 million, 65% of those 18 years and over. And we now need to add to that target, those between 11 and 18. And we now see the US now approving between five and 11, right? So, you know, this, the, 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 um, this, is, this thing keeps changing the overall vaccination as we move along globally and even in Jamaica. And what is that best pathway to achieving some, that level of, uh, of um, at least 65 to 70% of, um, of our population being vaccinated? How do we best get there from where we are at this point in time? Now, um, what we are clear on is that um, the, the use of the word mandate and um, in having a discussion with um, Don Webby of GK, Don says, you know, he changed the language to requirement rather than mandate. You know what I mean? Because mandate just, just puts everybody's back up. And, um, and therefore, how is it that we construct the conversation to get people to where, um, to, to a point where they can make an educated and informed decision um, based on all the miscommunication that they have received and the fact that maybe we have not been engaging them in a hand-to-hand -hand and um, in, on a very personal level, you know? So um, in, at the outset, um, you know, we worked along with, and Lloyd led this process along with Conrad, Carla, um, in pulling together JMA, JCC, um, Jeff, PSOJ, to pull it all together to have develop protocols and a risk-based approach and a step-by-step -step approach to how do you work through your workforce to get to a place of making some decisions around uh, the vaccination of your, of your, of your team. Now, this is a step-by-step -step process which, we, which was followed by Mr. Jason Hengel at, at Jix. And we wanted to, to, for Jason to be able to articulate it in a real way. And we wanted for Conrad and Carla to take us through step-by-step -step what that protocol process looks like. Because for us to get there, we can always speak at the national level, but it has to be done at the level of the workplace and, in the, and, in, and at the level of the micro level to get vaccination done. One, one job is going to get it done. And it has to be done at the level of the individual, at the level, at the firm level. And we must have vaccine policies, protocols in place. And that's why Lloyd Distant, Conrad George, Carla, I, Megan, all of them took the time out to develop those protocols. So I think that is important that we get them out there so that people understand the process that they should use to get to the place where they need to get to in terms of vaccinating the workforce, right? Um, another, another area is that when we met with the prime minister as a private sector group, we had a one-on-one -on -one with the prime minister and we, we discussed the, the, uh, the, the possibility of a task force and the prime minister named the task force and said he was clearly, clearly wanted to, to, to have a review of the process and have recommendations and consultations done and a task force would have been named. The task force has been up and running for the last couple of weeks and, um, and has been consulting um, across the private sector, across the political, um, in, in the political, with, with political parties. I believe there, that there have been meetings also. And um, so therefore there, is a, there, there are many things that are occurring and we wanted us kind of say, what does this roadmap look like to us getting there? What do we as individual private sector firms need to do to get there? What is that advised route, that roadmap that we take at the level of our firms to get there, right? And, um, and um, so therefore, we go, we're gonna continue this process of educating, of bringing the, the best practices to bear as we develop them, such that um, our members across JMEA, JCC, JEF, and, um, and, other, and other private sector entities outside of even this grouping can get the benefit of the thinking and we really want to take it into the public domain, right? Um, when we met to the prime minister also, he had asked us to look at sectoral targets, tourism, manufacturing, and BPOs. 
And there have been, um, we know that tourism has been working through their targets and the BPOs have been working on their targets also trying to get to somewhere around 80% of their um, workforce. It's, it's, it is going to be a process. And we believe that using the example of two, um, a couple of firms last time we had Carimed and they have been, um, they took a particular position in terms of vaccinate or test. And, there, and, um, and therefore we have just heard recently that there is some um, legally there is, that is being tested. And secondly, um, uh, we have other, have other firms like Jason who went through a process and therefore we want to be able to demonstrate the various ways and, put, and vaccine policies that can be utilized in the workplace. So therefore, that is what this is all about. And um, in terms of um, bringing our members and private sector across Jamaica up to speed as to the way forward so that we can start, we can continue to move forward towards hitting the targets, the hitting targets. So on that note, um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Christopher Zacco, who has been leading the um, oversight group of the private sector vaccine initiative and, um, and has been doing a wonderful job providing the leadership. But I want to say one more thing before we go. And this is just to say, when we look across the globe and we look across the region and we see the, the, how, the, 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 how things progress, where Trinidad and Barbados, they got to like a level of 40%, 50% vaccinated of their population. Then they introduced safe zones. You know what I mean? As a, where um, vaccinated people can attend high risk events or, or job families, specific job functions would, require, would be required to be vaccinated. Re vaccine requirement or mandate, but some job functions would require vaccination. We see that in Canada, we see that in the US, and we see it in, in other areas, education, public health, and other areas where they mandate it. Now, that is down the road. That is down the road. And as we evolve through this, through this, you know what I mean, through this, um, this vaccination journey as a country, there will be at some point in time that these are going to be very much under consideration. And we hear the prime minister speaking about at 50%, he will consider vaccine options. We're not clear on exactly what that means, but we know if we look at what is going on globally, that these other options or actions will come into play at some point in time. So on that note, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so folks, good evening. And um, I just going to give a an update on, on what the PSBI has been, has achieved. Um, we have a tremendous um, secretariat headed by Safra Brown and a number of the PSOJ team are big, big um, supporters and, and, and hard workers for the PSBI. Um, I want to echo what, what Keith said in terms of you know, next steps in, in by the government, etc. We have found that, that we, you know, our view is that we don't have a supply problem anymore in terms of sites. Um, what we have is a, a hesitancy problem. And, you know, I think we're behind the eight ball in terms of the messaging on that. I think we were behind in, as a country in terms of getting out there ahead of the the fake news with the messaging. And um, I think it's our view at the PSBI that some additional steps have got to be taken to get those numbers up. We are seeing a, an increased take up in the last week or so at our sites. We've also um, been working with the government through the National Commit Task Force that Peter Meledo represents the PSBI on. Um, but in our view, we need, I think, as a private sector to advocate more and more for additional measures. Keith mentioned safe zones. A number of firms have gone in the direction of, you know, vaccinate or test. Uh, I can say that a number of firms that I am associated with and, and other colleagues of mine are associated with 
are working through that process ourselves. Um, but I don't think we're really gonna get those numbers up uh, to where we need to get to in the time frame that we need to get them without additional measures. So, you know, it's a work in progress. We have made great progress, but we have a lot of work left to do as a country in my view. And in the view of the PSVI, which I, I have the honor of chairing. So PSVI update, we have facilitated around 26,000 vaccinations to date. We have had 71 vax days, vax days at company locations. Um, more than 350 private sector entities have participated at our Waterloo Girl Guide Center, which is really the, the catch-all in terms of all private sector companies are welcome once you register. Um, we've been in 10 parishes. We've covered all the sectors of the economy. And we've done more than 60 hours of acceptance where we go in and do sensitization in the companies that um, for over 30 companies. So hardworking, we're way ahead of where we were a few months ago. We have you know, cracked the door, put our foot in the door and we've walked straight through. We're not happy with the 26,000. We, we really would have loved that to be 260,000. Um, we had a target of, we have a target of 500,000 in the PSBI. Um, you know, let's stick to it. What I'd ask um, members here today is to use your leadership. You know, you all have influence in one area or another. We have found at Sajid Corps that, and we put a lot of effort into it. I've put many hours of my time and my team have put a lot of hours of their time. We've had Zoom meetings with a thousand people, bringing in Dr. R. Scott, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are up to about 70%, but it was hard work. It is hard work. And I'm urging everyone to use their leadership within their companies, within their sphere of influence, talking to the teams, giving them the facts and really pushing hard for, for the private sector employees and their families to get vaccinated because that's, that's kind of where we are as, a, as the PSVI. That's where we want to get to. That's our main focus. I want to add to that um, we also are available for community vax days sponsored by companies and um, Safran team did one recently at the, at the transport center. Um, I don't know if you have done any more SAF. Yeah, we did one on Saturday with MJ Trucking in Waltham Park. Right. So we are open for for um, companies to to um, sponsor Vax Days in communities, and I think it is a strong message when we do that as a private sector. And the more and more we do that, is the more and more we contribute. So, President. That is my update. So I don't know if there are any questions or we'll take questions at the end. Back to you. I think it's a, um, just in case there are questions, a good point to take some questions or who else you have, what, who's next on the agenda? Um, was it, is it Safri? Yes, I think Safri may have some more details that she wants right. to share. And then after that, we can take the questions right. for PSVI. Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, evening, everyone. I'm going to ask. Um, Calando is um, going to do some case studies. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about um, companies that have hosted successful vax days. We've done over seventy vaccination days now with companies. In fact, I think it's a considerable amount more than that. Um, and we've kind of looked and seen what are some of the things that work to create successful VAX activities for companies. Um, so they're kind of four key areas um, or four key things that we recognize to, uh, to, to be part of that success. One is a, a visible and involved business leader or business leadership. And that's really where at the very top and across the top, there's really um, the promotion, the support, the creating an overall environment of information sharing, uh, opportunities for question asking, and then access. And it's really about, um, from the leadership perspective, them driving um, these messages around vaccination uh, and around how we're gonna get past as a company, the, um, the issues surrounding COVID. 
also looking at collaboration with other entities. So we found that companies that open up and collaborate with other companies through their suppliers, their subcontractors, their customers, um, or even just companies in and around the geographic area where they are. Also, there is this, um, this sense that when they all come together, they have much more successful days as well. And others see others um, coming to the vaccination activity and come and, and get vaccinated themselves. You do recognize there's often a big take up of people on the day who were not registered, um, but, but see what's going on and come and get involved. Uh, also having an access accessible and efficient vaccination site. Um, so making sure you know, it's easy to get vaccinated, you take away all the difficulties surrounding that. And then uh, what, what Chris mentioned earlier, which was a lot of the sensitization sessions, uh, which is really, really important because the truth is that most people are not vaccine, are not anti-vaxxers, they are vaccine hesitant. And really what they want to do is they, they want to ask questions. What we find is that some of the sites that we're doing now, the more rural sites or the more community sites, we actually have to have doctors on site purely to talk to people. So not just whereas before we'd have doctors on for observation, we're recognizing now that everybody wants to talk to a doctor and some of them will stand and have a 30 minute conversation with the doctor and then decide to go and get vaccinated. So we recognize that people need that sort of access as well. So information is really, really important. So continuing to provide that information. Those are the kind of sort of high level points that we've, we've really taken from these vaccination activities. And Kalando will go through a few very specific examples. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's next for the PSVI, because I know there's a lot of questions about how we get these numbers up nationally. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the strategies that we have. So I'm gonna hand over to Kalando now. All right, thanks, Safri. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Karimid and, um, and as Safri said, we would have noticed these main um, things that the, the, these four main things that we've identified. And then sometimes there are some additional uh, variables to consider. But on, on their day, 445 was what Paramed did on Vax Day. Um, and if, if you were not aware of the story, you know, the group chairman was involved and visible. They did have a doctor visit the plant and walk the floor along with Sir um, Christian to answer questions. And then they also invited customers and contractors uh, to create a positive vibe around the uh, Vax Day as well. Uh, we know that subsequent to that, they did announce that they're going to be doing, um, you know, they included some deadline for people to get vaccinated and then a couple of other companies followed. So uh, uh, Flo, National Bakery, uh, Pegasus, that, that was a major one, 1,200 on the day. Again, from Flo's side, they did a number of sensitization sessions. I think they had the sensitization sessions, you know, three weeks running, one every week kind of thing. Brought in Dr. Ennis at one point. They did participate in the pilot. They promoted the VAX Day um, heavily among their, their audience, their staff, and they did provide um, positive vaccination um, day activity. They did all sorts of things to get their people to come out. Um, the, they did have a, you know, a, a team member die very close to the, the vaccination day and that did bring out a couple more people. So you know, we sort of checked that as well as one of the things, but they did a lot of work leading up for several weeks, not just, you know, not just it's gonna happen and then they started the promotion. HGS, now their approach, and, and, and even though this was, this captured their first day, I have to tell you their second day, they did over 700 and they took a very similar approach. They hosted a acceptance session and they reported that 80% of the people who were on the call made a decision. And they, at their session was the day before the VAX day. And 80% um, of those people on the call, which was nearly 200 people at the time, I think, made a decision to come get a vaccine after having their questions answered. And so for their second day, what they did was to, um, they actually did three sessions. They had different groups. And so they did three additional sensitization sessions. And then on the day, they, they brought out some games and all sorts of other things and had a lot of consideration for people who might have had children. They, they did a whole lot. And so it wasn't just that there was going to be um, second dose vaccination, but that they needed to have that conference, that, that sort of face-to-face, -face, here's an opportunity to answer questions as well. Most of us might have known that with, with HGS, they did have a, a, family, um, a team member die, and then it was a lot of media attention, but that was for their first one where they did 410, and then for their second one where they did seven, 
plus they did three three um, sensitization sessions. Red Stripe uh, did six thirty on the day. Again, they had a lot of uh, attention, a lot of um, attention drawn to the whole effort by their CEO internally. They hosted a acceptance sensitization session, I think, the Friday before. They did have ongoing internal promotion, including some of the content we would have sent, and they were doing that for months leading up. They promoted their VAX day and uh, also participated in the pilot that we had, and they opened it up to uh, others along the belt to, to participate as well. So that gave them their 6.30. Um, Sajikor, obviously, we know that um, Sir Zaka has been obviously leading this project, very visible with that, and also with his own people. Uh, they had ongoing promotion. He mentioned the, 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 the sensitization session that they did with um, Raman R. Scott, which even from then they had invited other companies to join in that sensitization session. So that was a big one, just to ensure that you know, their people could get their questions answered and also participated in the pilot. And on the day they did open it up to um, you know, neighboring companies to participate. So that would have helped them. And over their two days, they, they did 1100. We would have mentioned Ray and Nephew here at the time, special mention for them. They also had quite a number of, they did a VAX day as well, sorry, a, vax, a, a sensitization session that we facilitated with them. They did implement a video series internally, which also featured Dr. Joyce Spence. And they had ongoing promotions internally using some of our content as well, promoted the VAX day and also invited some of your community members to come down. Um, I know that they did their second jab session today. I'm not sure what the number is because the team just came back in here uh, 310 on 301 on the day. So we wanted to give them a special mention because of the, the approach that they would have taken. And so those are just I think, six companies that we, are, we highlighted that we noticed their approach brought the numbers out. Safri, back to you. Thanks, thanks Kalando. Um, so if we could just go to the slide after this, uh, which is really the, the four key points that we had mentioned. Can you move on Kalando? Um, which is VAX. So it's a visible leader or visible leadership, uh, accessible vaccination, a collaborative approach. And as mentioned, sensitize, sensitize, sensitize. Uh, you can't do too much um, of that. And so we really recommend that you continue to do that. In terms of the PSVI, um, so can you go to the next slide, Kalando? So really, we were able to facilitate any company at any size. Um, we're able to do large vaccinations, people 300 or more, as, is, as noted, we've done as many as 1,200 in a day. Um, we welcome the challenge to do more in, in a given day. Um, and uh, this includes not just obviously companies, but also now opening it up to communities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We've been doing some, um, some mapping with uh, Paris Luai, Dr. Luai, to look at which communities are increasingly vulnerable um, because they're not getting the vaccine take up and they're not getting really the access to vaccination. Um, and then working with companies who would like to support vaccination at the community level or with a specific demographic, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, we can do small sites. So we, you know, we, we recently went and started doing at companies. We did a great day at Myers Fletcher where we did about 150. We did an NCB branch uh, location where we did 120. And we'll go in for two or three hours with a small team and vaccinate small numbers. And we started to do even smaller numbers um, with a really, really micro tiny team where especially for businesses and companies that have multiple locations outside of, of, of the, the, the Kingston metropolitan area that they want us to kind of sort of almost do like a, a crawl from one site to the next. So to do really small numbers. So we're able to also facilitate that. Um, as you know, we have our weekly site at Girl Guides. We will be piloting a new site down on Spanish Town Road. Um, JMEA has had a lot of requests from the uh, manufacturers, distributors that are, that are sort of down by three miles, Spanish Town Road, Marcus Garvey. So we'll be piloting a site down there on Fridays at um, potentially, I think it's designed by Mark is the location um, where companies would be able to send their employees um, down there. Uh, so, so look out for that information. But again, companies, you can continue to send and book for your team members to come any, every Thursday to Girl Guides on Waterloo Road, 10 to six. Um, in terms of our community vax day, 
um, as mentioned, uh, this is really about CSR. So a lot of companies are already invested in community outreach. So this is if you want to support your community outreach and actually help vaccinate communities. Part of that, as we know, has to do with take up. So it's not just about putting in the vaccination activity. It's about all the work that has to happen ahead of time, working with the local community organizations, local community partners, doing the local um, education and awareness raising. And then we go in and we do the vaccination activity. So as mentioned, we've been doing some, some, some profiling of communities um, to identify which communities we really need to be focusing on. Uh, we, we're, we will be working more, much more closely with the Ministry of Health um, on this initiative, which is that they're starting to roll out their community education program, which is really um, a kind of uh, uh, initiative that they have to do the education awareness raising within communities before their vaccination activity. And they have a, a lag time of four to six weeks per community. Um, so they do all this work so, sort of leading up to it and then they have the vaccination activity. Um, and we're gonna be hope, um, working with you with many companies to see how you can all support this activity, whether it's through you know, um, distributors that distribute things within these communities, whether it's trucks that we can wrap, for example, MJ Trucking has indicated they're happy for us to wrap their trucks in the, the messaging that goes out to these communities and all these other areas of sensitization. Um, and again, setting up community VAX action groups um, and mobilizing uh, the community through local partners. So, so that's kind of a little bit um, of what we've been doing and the direction that we're going. Uh, the, the longer this goes on, though, the, the, the harder you have to work for each vaccination. So if we look back to the day one where, you know, everybody swarmed the minute they could get vaccines, everything was swarmed and everybody stood up for six hours. Uh, the truth is that, that each day we work harder and harder for vaccines, for vaccinations, um, and we have to continue doing that. Part of it, though, is that we operate under the premise that everybody has been given equal access to vaccination, and that's not the case. Uh, but remember, access isn't just about physical access. It's also about access to information um, and access to the opportunity to be vaccinated in a way that you are comfortable with. Um, and so I think it's important. I think the companies that have been doing vaccination in their companies, it's the right move. Um, I think that we have to get more outreach. We have to get further out into the communities um, and we have to get out more, uh, not just more regularly, but in a way that, that people are comfortable with and that's something that we will continue to work with all of you on um, and all of the companies that have so far really mobilized for this effort. So that's a little bit about where we are at the PSVI. So I'll hand back over to you, Chair. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sarkey. I, I want to add sure, to sure, Keith, go ahead. I'd like to um, always put something on Sarkey's plate just to um, give her a hard time. But um, it is Sarkey, they're targeting the over 60s um and in in the community and if this is the this is the demographic or the age group that uh, that is you know really you know when they when um when when they're unvaccinated and they get sick they end up in the hospital and um when they end up in the hospital and and, and public health capacity is overwhelmed then we have economic restrictions so therefore it makes sense for us as a as a private sector to body through corporate social responsibility to target that community in the various areas with your small mobile, um, your small mobile, um, you know, uh, modus operandi that you have, you have developed. You know what I mean? So if when Paris Leo, who worked with us, um, you know, like last year with our COVID response fund, I identified those people in the various communities, 130,000 in across Jamaica. And you, um, thirty percent of them are vaccinated, and you go after and you target those. Then we would see, I mean, from a corporate social responsibility, if we could, um, you know, if we can't get the government of Jamaica to get on board and to really work with us and focus on those areas, then what can we do as a, as private sector bodies to really um, to either get the government to the table or for us to start initiating an effort in that regard. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that we really have to work through the local health departments, um, especially when it comes to that kind of targeted approach. And I mean, the, the, the local health departments will, will take the support that we can offer, but also help target it. So, so we've really just started the dialogue on a kind of sort of local <clears throat> level. 
um, to really look at how we can support at that level. Before we were really focused on kind of nationally at the ministry, ministerial level. Um, and we recognize now that, now that you've gotten sort of the, the easy big numbers out to really start to get those, those sort of harder numbers, those more at risk communities, um, your over 60s, your more isolated individuals and so on. We've now really got to start working at the local at the local level, and part of that is working closely through the local health departments. But recognize that what that means is that when you do a vax activity, you're not going to hit a thousand people. You might you might be able to do a vax activity, um, and you're going to get forty people. But you're getting forty high risk people in very remote communities. But recognize there that 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 means that the 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 cost per vaccination is going to go up because accessing the individuals and getting to them and being able to support them now becomes a much more sort of um, individual activity versus when 5,000 people descend on the arena. Um, and so we have to be aware of how can we leverage the private sector resources, you know, the, the, the transport facilities and so on um, to get out into these communities and to get where people are, where you might go in and it's 10 people over 60 you're vaccinating or 10 people that you're looking to vaccinate and, and recognize that, that that has to be part of the strategy. It can't just be the big numbers. And I mean, Safri, I mean, we have we have been in the inner city communities where you know we're with Mark Golden today, and we had a meet with Mark Golden today around the vaccination strategy, of the leader of the opposition, and trying to have everybody really depoliticize, depoliticize, and really look at community engagement. Very good meeting, and Mark has agreed to engage with the task force around that. But it is like he says in in a in a one mile square in in his constituency, he might have 30, 40, 000 people. You know what I mean, and um, and therefore, you know, if you if you set up an, a stroke, if you set up a site in there and you remain for, you know, or come back every week for a few weeks, and target the and target um the um the target the the, the, the over sixty, then you will you will see some success. And as you yeah. said, as Professor Gordon Shirley said, it's going to take hand to hand combat at an individual level too jab by jab to get this thing, get it done and take it really to a granular level. Is this, the, as you said, the big number thing, that is, that's, that, is, that is behind us now. Yeah. Sorry, Colleen. Okay, Key, thank you. Thank you for that um, addition. Uh, Safri, thank you for your presentation. It was quite comprehensive. We did have one question in the chat though from Camille Watt, she wanted to know what vaccines are we administering at the PSVI? So we're currently administering Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. um, when the ministry was vaccinating with Pfizer, we were able to get some for a number of our sites um, where we did sort of family vax days and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously since that day when they issued the instruction that nobody else would get Pfizer until the next shipment came in, we haven't received any Pfizer. Uh, we do have a, com a number of companies who did family vax days and are well due their second dose. Um, and, you know, we really keep our fingers crossed that those come in soon. But, I, you know, I do think it's important that we're realistic with people moving forward um, based on the supply of Pfizer that's anticipated in. If we're really, really serious about getting our kids back face to face, then we have to recognize that the Pfizer that does come in um, will probably only be utilized for second doses due and children. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, she has a follow-up question. She's asking whether or not it's free. Oh, okay. So how the private sector vaccine initiative works is we work through companies who would like to increase and improve access to vaccination for their team members or their communities. So the companies cover the costs um, to operate the PSVI in terms of the nurses, the doctors. The, I mean, it, it takes quite a bit. So the more companies that actually vaccinate through the PSVI, is mm -hmm. you know the the more resources that it frees up for the ministry to be able to focus on them. So I think that you uh, we individuals don't pay for vaccination. There's no individual ever charged for vaccination under the PSVI. It's really a cost that companies absorb um, as part of uh, this um, their their overall CSR and their drive to to get back to to normality. All right, and just to you know just to inform those who may not know on the call, how can they get in touch with PSVI to organize a vaccine? Absolutely. So you can email us info at psvija.com. We also have a website, uh, which is uh, psvija.com. Um, and yeah, absolutely email us. My email is safri at psvija.com. 
Um, and we're obviously, you know, as I said, we can do many different sizes. Initially, when we started, we really focused on the large numbers, 350 or more. Um, but now we, we've ad um, adapted and developed for different size companies with different needs. So we recommend anybody who's interested, um, email us um, or, call, or call and we'll... we'll yeah, the number is 33909888. 3390988. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Jeffrey. I see a comment here, a commendation actually from Sharma Taylor in the in the chat. So kudos to you and the PSVI team, Safari. Um, if there are no further questions on the PSVI, uh, we will move on to the follow-up discussion on our vaccine work, workplace vaccine policy session that we would have had last month. I want to acknowledge the presence of Carla and Harris Roper, our second attorney who would have been a part of that initiative. She was not here earlier. And also Mrs. Donna Duncan Scott from JMB, who will also be joining us. So for this session, I'm going to invite Mr. Lloyd Distant to, to give us an overview of the direction that we've taken so far with the with the vaccine policies and guidelines. And then we will start that discussion and going into the QA thereafter. Thank you, Claudine, and please forgive me for not turning on my camera. Uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, so just over four weeks ago, probably closer to five, six weeks ago, uh, we would have issued, worked, worked alongside our union colleagues, but probably more so with, with professionals in the human relations and employee section, both legal and industrial relations, to develop, set up policies and guidelines, policies and guidelines to, to guide and recommend to businesses how we should, should approach policies in the workplace in relation to the, the the COVID-19 related policies. Um, I know everybody, everybody only talks about vaccine, vaccine policies or vaccine mandates, but our commentary was broader than that. The commentary was about putting policies in place to treat with COVID-19 in general. Uh, so we, we, we certainly recognize from the very onset the importance of, of, of businesses protecting their employees, protecting their customers, and of course, protecting the sustainability of your business. Uh, as a result of that, we, the policy was structured to look at approaches that would ensure that you, we recognize the, the types of things that we needed to do. So as, as a business owners, business leaders, uh, you know, wearing your mask, sanitizing, social distancing, but beyond that, the importance of vaccinations as well. And in the course of the conversations, we made se several specific recommendations in relation to the approaches. Not necessarily to look at it as a broad scale policy, but a policy that actually treats with the specific requirements of your business. I'm not gonna get into the details because I have we have with us today, Conrad, George, and Carla, and Ropa, the two persons who actually led pulling this together. So I'm going to start off by asking Conrad just to share a bit with us about you know, the structure of the recommendation. Uh, and then we'll ask both Jason and Donna to speak about what they've done in their businesses. And we'll come back to Carla to sort of help us pull it together prior to Q&A. So let me, let me Conrad, take us off first. Yeah, Lloyd, let me ask you, Lloyd, is it possible for us to, to put the document up because there is a nice step-by-step -step process inside there, inside the document that, you know what I mean, if you walk them through that, you know what I mean, I think would add value to, you know what I mean, and that's what we want. Absolutely, yes. No, certainly, yes, we already should put it up. So, you know, just keep it simple for people. So, therefore, this is the process that we go through, um, the recommended process. To, to, to develop your policies, certainly. Yeah. So let's get that up on screen. And in the meantime, we ask Connor to get started. Well, th thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, and actually, Keith, your suggestion there was extremely helpful because the very first thing I was going to ask our, our 
group to look at was the front page and particularly the top of the page, which lists all of the organizations that supported and promote this protocol. And it's, it includes the Jamaica Employers Federation, Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, JMEA, the PSOJ, and very significantly, the Joint Confederation of Trade Unions, Jamaican Confederation of Trade Unions. And I think I should perhaps start there because this is a protocol that was designed to provide simple, clear, and legally correct procedures that can be followed by any employer in Jamaica with a view to moving all of their workers to safety. And for the most part, safety is universal vaccination. And most significantly, because no protocol really has any, any efficacy unless it has teeth, if at the end, all of the procedures having been followed, workers or and then a worker refuses to comply with what is reasonably required by the employer, the employer can dismiss the worker. And because the protocol sticks very closely to the legal position, and it is also supported by the trade union movement, if an employer follows those procedures and unfortunately in the end has to dismiss a worker or a group of workers, that employer is in a strong position to go to the Industrial Disputes Tribunal if he is taken there and defend his position successfully. One, because the law has been complied with, and two, the unions have acknowledged that that is the correct process. So that, I start with that. Um, Conrad, Claudine, can you put the document up, please? She's working on it. Minky. Go ahead, Conrad. Sorry. Well, you have to click on a, on a, on a, a link, I see. Um, so I start with that because it is, it's a very practical, significant utility value that the protocol has. And so the, the, the purpose of bringing peace to this process may have been served and hopefully will be served by the protocol. The purpose being to enable employers to require their employees to be safe and for the most part to be vaccinated. Let me emphasize that you know, when, when we started discussing this, we recognized and the PSOJ meeting that I attended recognized that this crisis of vaccine hesitancy is perhaps even more serious than the initial onset of the virus when the entire world was pretty well in the same sort of a position. We are now faced with a situation where most of our competitors are way ahead of us in terms of vaccinations. Little Cayman just across the sea is 78% vaccinated and we are struggling at somewhere around 10, 12%. So it, 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 it is vitally important that our protocol is effective, is, is correct legally, and also has teeth if necessary. It's not a protocol designed to cause people to be fired but it's a protocol that ultimately can justify dismissal if in the circumstances it's necessary. So if I can, without going any further on that side of things, take you very briefly through the protocol and thank you very much, Claudine, for putting it up on the screen. You'll see at the, at the outset, it sets out at paragraphs one to four, the, the received medical position, which in effect is that vaccinated people are far less likely to contract the virus and therefore to pass it on. And therefore vaccinated people are safer to be around than unvaccinated people. Unvaccinated people therefore pose a threat to those with whom they come into close contact. And that leads straight into paragraphs five to nine of, sorry, five to, yeah, five to nine of the protocol, um, which, demonstrate the legal position that an employer owes duties to each and every one of his workers and everybody who comes into his workplace or interacts with his business. An employer owes a duty of care to provide a safe system of work for all of his employees and anybody that comes into contact with the business. And if the employer 
does not apply state-of-the-art requirements and state-of-the-art measures. And as a result of that, somebody falls sick and perhaps, God forbid, even dies, that employer can be sued. So you have, as an employer, an underlying obligation to do what is necessary to keep people in your workplace safe. And if that requires vaccination, which for the most part it will, hardly any employee doesn't come into contact with any other employee or member of the public or customer. So from an objective point of view, on the basis of the medical advice, having unvaccinated people in pretty well any workplace in Jamaica puts the employer at risk of liability or increased liability. So if you, if you look at paragraph 10 of the protocol, you will see that this may be particular, that there may be particular circumstances in which it may be unreasonable for an employee to refuse to comply with his employer's policies intended to contain the spread of COVID-19, as to do so would be likely to increase the employer's risk of being liable for injury or loss suffered by another. Such circumstances could amount to a breach of the employee's duty of good faith and fidelity to the employer, and therefore breach of such employee's contract of employment. So you have a, a confluence of duties. The employer owes a duty to keep everybody safe. And if that duty means everybody needs to be vaccinated and an employee refuses to be vaccinated, that can amount to a breach of the employee's own duties under his own implied contractual obligations. So basically, it all boils down to a, a, a mixture of legal duties, the result of which is that employers need to get people vaccinated if it's necessary, and for the most part it is, and employer, employees need to comply with the requests of the employer to be vaccinated wherever it is necessary, and for the most part it is necessary. Now, the next section in the protocol is the relevant statute law, our local Jamaican industrial relations law. And it means in straightforward terms, that all the circumstances of every case must be looked into before you dismiss anybody. So you cannot make a blanket mandate requirement that everybody must be vaccinated. And if anybody refuses, you just dismiss them because our law requires a dismissal to be justifiable in all the circumstances for it to be passed effectively by the IDT. So it is absolutely vital that nobody issue a mandate which is not taking account of individual circumstances of individual employees, not in taking account of individual classes of employees, but merely an instruction. It doesn't matter whether you're at home working or you're working in an office or wherever, you just need to get vaccinated. Well, that is a risky line to take because if it is not successful in achieving full vaccination, those employees who refuse to be vaccinated may have a very good case at the IDT to say it was an unjustifiable dismissal. They didn't ask me if I had any medical conditions. They didn't ask me if, if I could work from home. They didn't consult with me at all. They just told me I had to be vaccinated. So the, the, the distinction I want to draw is between going carefully, complying with the rules and the law, the principles of the law, and actually getting there in the end. On the other hand, issuing orders and edicts. And unfortunately, perhaps, if you don't succeed, ending up in the Industrial Disputes Tribunal or court. So you might ask, what are the steps that need to be followed in order to comply with the law? And they are extraordinarily simple and straightforward. If you turn over the page to paragraph 16 of the protocol, you will see that step one is you need to assess the risk. That's obvious. It, it, because you, our law expects objectivity. You cannot say to your workers, I believe everybody should be vaccinated and therefore you should be. What you need to do is to approach it in the most objective way you can. Conduct an assessment of the risk. That won't take long. All you have to do is spend a few minutes or perhaps a couple of hours 
considering what categories of workers work closely together. And the chances are you will come to the conclusion that they all work too closely with people for anybody not to be vaccinated. And you will have concluded step one. Step two, you then design a policy that provides the best level of protection for transmission, for avoiding transmission of the virus. Well, having done the risk assessment, the determination of the policy ought not to be particularly difficult either. Whatever the nature of your establishment, unless your workers work completely remotely or do not come to contact with people, you are justified in having a policy that everybody ought to be vaccinated. So step three, having come to that conclusion and propounded that policy, then in relation to any employee who refuses to comply with any aspect of the policy, applicable to him personally, determine if such refusal creates a real and significant as opposed to a hypothetical risk. So this is again, a stopgap. You've come to the conclusion that everybody okay. ought to be vaccinated. You've put it to the employees. You've put it to the employees and somebody has given you pushback or a group of people have given you pushback. Consider what they have to say. Reconsider if you really need them to be vaccinated. The chances are you will very quickly conclude that yes, they do need to be vaccinated. At which, at which point you move to the next step. If step three results in a conclusion that the presence of any such person who has refused to comply with any COVID-19 measures as above pose a real risk to others, the employer must now commence formal consultations with the employees in question. Now that, and I, I don't want to draw this analogy too closely, but it is in fact a practical analogy. When you're conducting a, a redundancy exercise, you as the employer come to the conclusion that through reorganization or diminution in the amount of work that's required, or what, for whatever reason, outsourcing, etc., the following people or positions need to be redundant. You, you conclude that 10, 15, 20 people, their positions are redundant. The law requires that you consult with the employees before you reach a determination that any one of them ought to be dismissed by reason of redundancy. There's a significant parallel to this here. You've concluded that all of these people need to be vaccinated. They've told you for whatever reason, they don't wish to be vaccinated. You, and they've, they've dug their heels in. You now conduct co consultation with them in accordance with the industrial relations code, section 19. Those consultations need not go on forever. You merely need as a matter of law to listen to the issues that they raise, answer whatever questions they pose, and it is, absolutely advisable that you should bring in a doctor as many of, of, of our, our colleagues have done to explain why what they're saying makes no sense. But it's vitally important that you conduct that process and you document it relentlessly so that nobody can say subsequently that you haven't done so. And if that draws a blank, you are entitled at that point to move towards dismissal. Now, when we, when we negotiated the terms of the protocol with the unions, the unions accepted all of what we've said so far. And the legal position, those employees having dug their heels in, you having done everything that's reasonable in terms of consultation and advice, answering questions, etc. They dig their heels in. As a matter of law, you can move straight to dismissal. You, fire, you, you serve charges on them. You call them to a hearing and you fire them. But some of the unions said, no, we really do not want that to happen quite like that. And they asked the protocol and we agreed that before going to that step, we have conciliation at the Ministry of Labor. So if there are you know, 20 people who dig their heels in and you're about to prepare charges under the protocol, you ought to take those employees to the Ministry of Labor effectively Effectively to give their representatives the last opportunity to tell them, listen, man, you know, you're on you're on a slippery, slippery slope and you need to come into line and try if they can to do something. Thereafter, the law, we come back to the law again and you are entitled to terminate by by reason of their being totally unreasonable and refusing to do what you have required reasonably in all the circumstances. So I. 
I commend the protocol to you as the safest way of applying pressure on a pretty short time scale to require your workers to do the right thing and for the most part to get vaccinated. And if you follow the steps closely, they give you some considerable protection if in the end you have a problem and you have to terminate somebody's employment, you will have, by following the steps, acted reasonably and correctly and fairly, which is what the law requires. Now, I know that there are all sorts of other alternatives that people have posed and suggestions, some from jurisdictions that have very different laws to ours. There's all sorts of stuff about testing and testing at people's expense, which I frankly advise you is not a good idea. Um, from a legal point of view, and it can get you into all sorts of difficulties. But that being said, I commend the protocol to you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't know if Carla wants to add anything to what I've said at this stage. Um, uh, what I understood, so, so they, were, they were going to have um, some other folks speak yeah. and thereafter. We could talk. So I, I will follow the agenda as was proposed, Conrad. I was just wondering if I'd left anything out that Carla wanted to, to supplement. Um, I think you have been sufficiently clear in terms of being very careful in how it is that employers walk through this process. I think um, what, what everybody needs to appreciate that a one-size-fits-all approach is not in their best interest. They really should take the time to assess each situation and to, to say whether or not it is reasonable to require the vaccination in the first place. And um, that will take some time to do, but it is most important if having walked through all the steps, you get to the point um, of, you know, saying that your employment will have to cease. So I, I think I'll talk a little bit about that um, later, but um, I think you've gotten it. I think most importantly, everyone should appreciate that this is not a one size fit all approach. You really need to establish that based on the roles, responsibilities of these particular persons, that this is one of the methods that are best required to uh, keep them safe for the employer to fulfill their legal duty to provide a safe place of work, safe system of working, a competent um, fellow staff, good supervision, all of that. And therefore, um, you must keep that in mind as a very foremost view in taking uh, any decisions. So I'll hold the rest of my thoughts until later. Thank you. Thank okay. you for that. Thanks, Mrs. Okay. Rojo. Do you have okay. another point, Mr. George? I want to add something that's mildly, mildly flippant. If you, follow, if you follow the protocol, you will not, by any account, necessarily need a lawyer. The time you will need a lawyer is when you don't follow the protocol and you get into all manner of problems and Carla and I might actually earn a fee or two. But if you follow the protocol, you have the best chance of not needing a lawyer. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Lloyd, I don't know if you wanted to say something. I see you're no, 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 on no, no, my, my, my comment is just a reiteration of what Conrad and Carla have said to me on multiple occasions. is take the time now rather than to take the time in court. And I think Conrad just re referred to that. So. So I think we can move on to, I, I believe we have Jason Hensel from Jakes and uh, Do Donna from JMMB to share their stories. Right, so uh, Mrs. Duncan Scott, I think you're here. I'm gonna ask you to start. Just to share with us, you know, Mr. George and Mrs. Roper have been saying it's not a one size fit all approach. Follow the protocol, but it's still not a one size fit all approach. So we really wanted to hear the different approaches being taken by various companies. And I know JMMB has taken a particular position that we would love for you to share with the members. And after you speak, I will invite Jason Hensel from Jake's to tell us 
how he got 100% vaccination at, at his company. No, I met Jason Todd first because he might have 100 <laughs> 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 no, my Hi. daughter, you go ahead. You go ahead. All right. I'll go to you, ladies. All first. right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, just quickly, really just I'm just reiterating what has been said. I think what um Mrs. Roper said a while ago is really key is the engagement. And that is our strategy, is a strategy of engagement. So just like Conrad said, we agreed that um this thing makes sense. It's a way to protect our team members. So we had we supported it as a company um, early that vaccination is something that we are encouraging our team members to get to get done. Um, the, we had a target of 90%, not 100, Jason, we have a 90% target. Uh, we did a survey internally and we realized that 4% of the persons who responded were not open to being vaccinated at all. They had no intention of being vaccinated. And we do have, um, currently right now we have about, we have about 30% working from home on and off and 10% working from home permanently, right, in our organization. So we thought a 90% target is quite acceptable. Also recognizing that some people for medical reasons would not be able to become vaccinated, right? Possibly. So we had setting our target now, then our conversation was to, um, we do, first of all, since the COVID crisis uh, pandemic, we've had biweekly on average meetings with our team leaders where we update on COVID protocols, um, any considerations, really keeping close to our team leaders um, in terms of how we, how we get to manage the, COVID in this pandemic and how we get to live with COVID, right? So we've been having those and um, we shared the target in terms of vaccination and we encourage our team leaders now to engage one-on-one -on -one with their team members and understand what the status is of that team member. And also if there are concerns, try and deal with the concerns or else send it up to, or we call our HR, we call it culture and human development, um, send it to CHGT so we can actually provide additional support for them. So it really, as um, Mrs. Roper said, and everybody's been really saying, it's about the heart-to-heart, one-on-one -heart, um, -on -one conversations. That is really where the action is. Uh, we, so at least our leaders have been, and it's a challenging conversation too because some leaders are, some team members don't really want to talk about it, but you still want to just introduce it. We haven't had, as I said before, currently our numbers are, we have, we have in Jamaica, we have results from 32 of our 40 departments, and it, which, is, which represents 500 team members, and 68% of them are fully or partially vaccinated. 29% are not vaccinated. We call those undecided, right? Um, or haven't taken action yet because only 3% have, have said point blank that they, are, they don't wish to be vaccinated, right? And we will respect that. We can respect that because we're living, we're working towards a 90%. In Trinidad, the numbers look the same. We are at 70% in Trinidad vaccinated in the bank in Trinidad. In the DR, which is the, they, they started much earlier with the vaccination efforts um, because they were they had it was available in the DR earlier they are now 90 percent 90 percent fully vaccinated and 94 percent um, and another four percent partial so they're almost at the 94 percent mark in terms of um, vaccination in the Dominican Republic so those are the results that we have and we are convinced that we can do this through oh we have to big up the PSOJ initiative, initiative because they when they came and they did a we did a Vax Accept session, it was very, very well received by the young people. They really appreciated it and it made a difference also in terms of um, helping the undecided to make decisions, right? So I think that I just wanted to reinforce that, oh, we are we have decided that we're not going the mandate route because we believe that we can get to our desired target 
through conversations and engagement. So that is our approach because they, 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 they manage it. It's it just, um, just fraught with too much. It's too much of a hot button thing. And you still have to have the conversation anyway. The bottom line is we have to deal with the concerns that the team member have and help them to work through this very important decision for themselves and for their family, right? As, and as a matter of fact, for Jamaica. So that is what I'd like to share. And I'm open to any questions um, after. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and we'll take the questions after. I'm sure there are many. Um, Jason, over to you. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that, Donna, and also to Conrad and Carla for all the work that they've put in. Um, so yeah, my, my team, 125 um, persons down in, in Treasure Beast and Elizabeth, you know, we were, obviously we're in the tourism um, industry and we were hit very hard, incredibly hard with the borders being closed in March of last year. Um, we started doing consultations with our, our team members starting in departments and literally going down to one-on-one -on -one and spending a considerable amount of time um, just talking about the history of vaccinations in Jamaica. Um, I was appointed to the, the vaccine commission um, and I learned a lot just from the one session that I had with Dr. Figaro. It was unbelievable. Um, when that man started to speak, you could, you could hear a pin, literally. Um, and I took copious amount of notes and, you know, looked up, of course, Spanish flu and the, you know, rubella and, and, and uh, measles and mumps and, and, of course, you know, the vaccine that you, you get when you're six, six weeks after birth, um, going into a primary school. Of course, the polio epidemic. Um, and it's funny, one of the things I did say is, does everybody know Mark Golding? Of course, everyone does. I said, you know, that, that, that man is here in Jamaica because his father came to work on the polio epidemic. Um, and it was his theory why he was born here. You know, we showed, um, we provided offering to pay persons um, for the days that they were going to get the vaccine, um, um, transportation, meals, Panadol, um, you know, you, you name it. Um, I offered myself to go and pick people up. And we also set a target of 90% um, initially. And one of the things that I, that I said to my team that may start to happen, I didn't know it at the time, I said we could very well see a scenario where customers are calling and wanting to know what our level of vaccination is. And, you know, I said that if the customers did ask and, and an employee said no, it is very likely that the, 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 the customer, you know, um, would say, boy, it's either your boss don't care about you or your government don't care about you or maybe you don't care about yourself. Maybe you're not taking it um, as seriously as you should. Um, I agree. You know, you, you, you can't shame people into this. You, you know, no, no question is a stupid question. Um, I, I pretty much had a, had a doctor on call um, for, for, you know, most of, most of this period. Um, and then unfortunately, those calls, did come in. they did start to come in um, by people asking, you know, what's the level of vaccination? I'm, I'm basically using that to decide where I take my vacation. So when we, we close down every year for three weeks to do annual renovations, and on the 1st of September, when we close, we had our annual general meeting um, as usual. And I said, look, you know, these calls are starting to come in. They're becoming more frequent. I don't want to lose any of you. I love all of you. You, you know, you're valuable. You've come a far away. So when we reopen in three weeks, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to require that you have, you have at least your first job. Um, I, you know, I said, look, it's a big decision. It's a huge decision. I'm not pretending. Otherwise, I know that, you know, there's some people who just suffer from anxiety and they're just, they're nervous about any little thing, much less, much less this. Um, and I, I saw the, the legal advice of, of, of Conrad George, um, and together we came up with, um, something called an amicable, um, separation. 
um, and we use the same calculation that is used for redundancy. Um, and at the end of the day, unfortunately, um, five persons um, opted to take that option. It cost, you know, cost us $1.1 million, which, you know, for a small company is small. And, you know, but the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, when we could to our database of, you know, 16,000 people um, to the Jamaica Tourist Board um, that we were 100% vaccinated, 100 vaccinated, it made a massive difference. And what happened is our, our, the persons who started coming to Jake started to become our ambassadors. You know, they were telling the other guests, you know, did you know that they're 100%? vaccinated here. Um, I have gone and spoke to many other companies, um, particularly in the parish. I, I went and spoke to the staff at, at YS Falls. I was invited to speak to Grace Kennedy, which um, for some reason, St. Elizabeth was their lowest, um, the lowest rate of vaccinations of all the parishes that they, that they serve. Um, you know, Pelican Bar, um, I am speaking to um, the persons at Little Ochi um, next week. I reached out to the Sandals South Coast, and, and that one actually um, gave me a bit of a surprise in that they have 268 employees um, who have gotten the first dose of Pfizer. And of course, because the second dose hasn't been available, um, it is causing a serious issue of you know, making people more nervous, um, anxious, um, and the general manager down there, you know, is, is, is um, you know, he himself actually is AstraZeneca, and he's saying to persons, look, you know, the AstraZeneca could, could end up be, could end up being um, the, the, the one that, that one. You know, we have this thing in Jamaica. Most Jamaicans have friends or family in the United States. And of course, some of our employees go up there and work. They want to visit. So Pfizer really has come out as the brand of choice. And it is heartbreaking to see us have to throw away 55,000 um, AstraZeneca. Um, but the truth of the matter is a lot of the Jamaican, our Jamaican people have really decided that they want the Pfizer. Um, is all the notes that I have. Um, I was with William Mafood last night um, and he said to me that um, a lot of supermarkets, hotels are now saying to him that his delivery people um, need to be vaccinated. So he met with his truckers yesterday. So I think as time goes on, we're going to see more and more people um, asking for the vaccine. We're, we're living in a consumer-driven um, society um, and need, we need to listen to that. And in mind, um, you do have to meet people where you are. It's not a one size fits all. It takes time. You have to build trust. Um, but you, know, you, you need to show the empathy, the support, you need to set a target um, and just be, be honest with your team as to what you want to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Mr. George, uh, Mrs. Rofo, do you have any immediate comments before we go into the questions from the, the audience? Yes, I do. I'd like, um, to, I'd like to commend both Donna and, and, um, and Jason for, for taking the time to do it painstakingly, carefully, and correctly, so that um, they get the best result. And you know, I, the only question I had for Donna was, given that you have so many people working from home, have you been able to accommodate those people who are either hesitant or anti by letting them work from home? Because once that can be achieved, there's really no basis for forcing them or trying to force them to be vaccinated because they're not troubling any of your other employees or your customers. Yes, we, we depending on the rule, you can work from home permanently. So we've identified those rules and some persons in those rules can work from home permanently. We're not sure about the, the intersect between the persons who are, because there's still a large group undecided. 
So we're still working through the numbers, but that's a definite um, option, definite option, um, I think, because we have quite a um, few roles that we can have work from home, you know? I wanted to add something. Um, what we realized is that Trinidad, Keith, I think Keith pointed it, said that we already had, in Trinidad, they have set up safe zones for people who have to, be, you have to be vaccinated to go there to access that, and in the DR as well. You know what I mean? So that also has made a big difference um, actually in the DR, not to our numbers, but to, um, it is impacting the DR numbers as well, you know? So that is, and I think we're probably likely to go in that direction, which makes a lot of sense, you know? So, yeah. um, so, Anything of yes, concern? Uh, no. Maxine, your mic is open, please. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, thank you. I have to endorse Conrad's um, position in terms of, you know, saying kudos to, to these um, two employers um, and also in respect of the continuity of effort because it's not going to happen overnight. I'll tell you, I'm not going to be hiding. My, my own dad, I have been having, I've had to be having this conversation with. And this is a gentleman who is, you know, worked with the bauxite into safety and health, um, trained, um, what we call that now, um, first aider. And it, it was interesting to hear um, Jason speak of the persons who, you know, by virtue of who they know and um, their relatives and so overseas that, you know, the Pfizer, the Pfizer is the best one, you know, the Rolls Royce, if you will, of, um, of vaccines. And it's unfortunate because what has happened in our country, because, you know, not to be political, but it, it has become politicized about the Pfizer vaccine. And until we are going to be able to address that. You know, I think people should address their mind to the fact that it's going to be very challenging as adults to get that vaccine if you, unless you have already had a first dose. Um, and so to me, the, the best vaccine right now, if you're going to be vaccinated is the one that's in your arm, not the one you like the best. Yes. So um, we have to take an approach of doing exactly what I've heard tonight um, in terms of having these conversations, providing information from credible sources, um, working through and looking at alternatives. Um, if it does come down to, you know, having done your risk assessment and you really don't have any, the alternatives are slim to none, you may very well have to have that kind of conversation to see if you can have a mutual separation. Um, you know, if persons hold their view, which they have, and um, you are not able to accommodate them having done all of what you've had to do. Um, my, my challenge remains a position where you have a blanket approach and say vaccinate or else, right? Because even in the, the legal um, framework in Jamaica under the Public Health um, Act and regulations that has a quote unquote mandate for children to be vaccinated, um, there are exceptions. Persons who have contraindications, for example, that their medical practitioner can um, you know, verify there are provisions in the law where vaccinations are currently quote unquote mandated for you to put in place. Um, you know, per those persons cannot be forced given their particular situations. So as employers, you must take those things into account. And the only way that is going to be able to be done is by having those conversations to be able to see that. Right. Um, it's, it's also very important to create an enabling environment. So I was very 
um, heartened to hear of the vaccine initiative and how they operate. Um, you know, I was told that in some of the places, just listening, that it's not just to say, oh, you can be vaccinated. They arrange transportation, Panadol, water, um, even pay for the days that persons take to go. Um, you know, we know that some persons, and it is expected by the medical um, community, that you may have um, situations where persons have the adverse effect. You know, they may not, they may feel lousy the day after. If that occurs, you have asked them to do something, make, um, you know, make the accommodations for them. And that happens for those one and those two. It, I've seen it happen in my own office where persons have gone out and taken their second dose and they call in and say, listen, I'm really not feeling well. You know, you make those accommodations. You really need to take everything into account. The other thing is, whilst vaccination is one of the very big ticket items, it is not the only item. And in fact, the law already puts in place a position under the DRM for social distancing, mask wearing, sanitization stations. And in some industries, they even have specific um, protocols like for the BPO industry. I would like that every employer puts the same amount of push out on those other um, requirements that the law already puts in place the same sort of um, importance is put to those as it is for the vaccine. The law is already putting those things as a requirement. It is not therefore that the vaccine is the only thing. If you check the protocol, the protocol speaks to all of the various um, provisions because even with vaccinations, the science tells us that you can have breakthrough infections. So you have to also continue with those other protocols. So my last two points, I just saw breaking news that constitutional motion is being filed in respect of one, at least one of the employers that have been spoken of online here today. And um, importantly, that was not taken from an employment law perspective, Conrad, but from a constitutional law perspective. So that is something that is quite an important approach. And we watch to see what is happening with that. I'm sure the courts will make space in its diary to hear this as an urgent matter because of the national import of it. But having said that, another aspect to be looked at is the fact that this question of mandating is really something that is going to be guided by government. So all these other things that we're talking about, safe zones, those things have come up in terms of the, the government either putting in a national policy or legislating. Certainly, I've heard Mayor Motley speak of it, um, Keith Rowley speak of it in the CARICOM region in terms of how they are setting up these safe zones. Um, I think also Guyana, has have also put those things in place, but those things have been done via government instruct. Mm -hmm. When we're talking now about the employment sphere, how you're going to manage that is through particular policies that is that are guided by the legal framework that we have sought valiantly to bring to your attention. And only after you've taken those steps and there is actually nothing else that can be done, it is that you're going to be moving in a direction. I don't like the word mandate. It, it, it puts a certain spin on things that creates um, challenges. It, it already builds, puts people's back up against a wall. And so if we are looking at that, we can, we can find another nomenclature to use in terms of what it is that you're seeking to do 
my, my own personal view is that terminology does create real challenges in workplaces. Yes. Um, so Keith, I saw your hand up. Yeah, man, a quick one. So um, in keeping your workplace and environment safe and your, your employees safe and your customers safe and everyone safe in this environment, there is um, vaccination and there is a process where you, the of screening called testing, right? To ensure that even if you have a breakthrough infection, that you have a that your environment is kept safe. So when you look at it, you're either going to be vaccinated, and there's a screening process for everyone. If that's the way you're thinking, testing, if, right? If, or you know what I mean, testing. And for those who are not vaccinated, there may be a different level. Maybe I'm just throwing that out as an approach of how you keep your environment safe because you have a vaccine requirement, but then there, after you work through the protocols step by step, as Conrad carried us through, then there is going, there may be a bunch of people that you can accommodate because of whatever, but therefore, then therefore there has to be tested. Who pays for that test is another question with, which has its own legal ramifications. But the principle of vaccine or tests to keep your environment safe and keep your customers safe if you're not going to vaccinate, you know what I mean? It is something that is worthy. It's not just a mandate. That's just, is that, and that's, it's a Jason, Jason required because of his industry after working through with all his staff that, they, that he required that they be vaccinated. And he worked that through with them to the end till he got to a conclusion. Now you work it through to a conclusion and you get to a place where I'm in financial services and, um, and therefore are in another industry that um, does not necessarily require a particular job family in place it, it, to have a, to be vaccinated because when you work through the process. But therefore, you are at risk because if you're ever vaccinated, you are more likely to spread it than if you're vaccinated. And therefore, there should be some testing and screening in place to protect the work, the workplace. I hear you, and you have no. So, that so you know, because sometimes we, when we hear vaccinate our test, we almost hear mandating our head, because of that's what that's what we have heard. But look at it from a different place, keeping it, keeping your work environment safe. Um, I hear you putting that as an alternative, and um, if it is that you you do get buy-in from the employee. It's, it's, um, it's something that you can pursue. Um, when you don't get that buy-in, you're basically almost back at the same place, to my mind. Um, and so you do consider you, you have a challenge. It's almost, uh, again, I am loath to- When you get to the same place where Jason got to, then you have some decisions to make. No, I, I'm loath to, to do that, but I'm thinking of, um, you know, the, the whole question of, say, layoffs. You have a conversation, your business is, you know, you've had a breakdown of equipment, whatever it is, and you place an employee on layoff. When you get to the end of um, a particular period, if you're not able to move back or you have a, a particular alternatives that persons don't um, wish to pursue, at the end of the day, you may very well have to get to, um, to the spot of terminations. And therein lies the issue. Um, if you get by and say, listen, we have sat down, we've chatted with you. For whatever the reason, you're hesitant at this point, you're not ready, um, you still you know, have a very strong view, um, notwithstanding that you don't fall into any of those exclusive, excluded categories that you, know, you could consider. Um, getting the testing um, position, especially if it is that you're, the, the employer is asking the employee to foot that bill, um, does create a challenge and may put you right back into the place of the employer having to make a decision as to whether or not that person will be able to continue. 
um, and you have to walk through that process. I'll ask Conrad to weigh in just for his thoughts at this point. Before before Mr. George comes on, I, we are running out of time and I don't want us to um, not take some of the questions from the audience. No, I think we so, need to just finish but this. Before, yes, finish I will part. allow you to speak, but I'm just going to ask everybody to put your questions in the chat so that we can take them as quickly as possible after this uh, conversation. Go ahead, Conrad. Go ahead, Mr. George. You're on mute, Conrad. On mute. Take it off mute, Conrad. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I, 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 somebody is got an open mic. Yes. Somebody has an open mic. Somebody has an open mic. I think they're muted now. I, I'd like to be very clear on the question. Conrad, you unmute again. Not sure what happened there. Go ahead now. Is that, is that okay now? Yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead. Testing has a very important place, as Keith pointed out, as something that may well, from a public health point of view, we are told, be a very useful supplement in protecting those who are vaccinated and also protecting those who are not vaccinated, but as a supplement to the whole vaccination drive. It certainly will not assist us in achieving herd immunity, but there can be breakthrough infections, as we are told, and therefore testing can be something that may be necessary, even if one has a 100% vaccinated staff. However, the key question about testing is who pays for it? And it's not possible to push that under the carpet. If an employer is of the view that because of the sensitivity of his or, or her operation, it is advisable in addition to the members of staff that he or she employs to have testing from time to time or on a regular basis as the case may be, then that is something that the employer needs to pay for. It is not something that an employer legally under our laws in Jamaica can use as an alternative to vaccination unless the employer pays for it. The example I've given before and I will give again is that you cannot send your driver to deliver a package in Montego Bay and tell him that he has to pay for the gas. As a matter of law, any expense incurred by an employee in the course of their employment at the instruction of the employer or properly incurred for whatever reason, must be reimbursed by the employer. And if the employer refuses to do that, it amounts in law to a constructive dismissal. So those people who are instructing their employees either to get vaccinated or to present a PCR test at their own expense are running the risk of constructive dismissal claims being made against them. Now, obviously, if the employer has sufficient muscle to force an issue and make these things happen without any complaint or demur, then fine, they get through. The concern that we lawyers must have though, is that we have to advise correctly in accordance with what the law actually is, as opposed to what somebody might be able to use force to muscle through. And our advice has to be that any expense properly incurred in the course of employment, like a PCR test, the cost of a PCR test is for the employer's account. That's the best I can. The only way you can get around that, and I think Carla alluded to this at the beginning, was that if the employee agrees. Now, the most likely scenario in which the employee might agree is if you've gone through all of the processes under the protocol and the employee is facing imminent dismissal, the employee might say, well, okay, what if I pay for a PCR test every three days or whatever? In those circumstances, you can say, okay, fine. You pay for it and you present it every three days and you can keep your work. So, but it has to be by agreement. Otherwise you, you are bound by the common law and the common law requires that the employer pays. That's my take on it. <laughs> 
suppose the employee, I see Ivan Davis asked the question, the employee agrees that they will pay for a test. That's fine. If the employee agrees, you have no problem. Right. That's not a problem. With, it's just as if you impose it as yeah. like say, go to Mobe, deliver this package, and by the way, pay for the gas. It's problematic. All right, thank you for that. All right. You saw that question, isn't the burden on the employee to prove that he, he or she is COVID free? Sorry, COVID -free. Chloe, but it yeah. is really. No, I mean, an employee has no obligation in law to prove that they haven't got a cold or they haven't got COVID or anything. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's out of the ether. You know, you as an employer have a duty to ensure that the workplace is safe and the employee needs to do all that is reasonable to comply with your reasonable requirements. But there's no duty on the part of an employee to walk around saying, you know, I haven't got this or I haven't got that or I haven't got the other. No, it's not a notifiable, it's not a notifiable disease. All right, thanks. Thanks for that, Conrad. Uh, I see Jerome here asking if he can legally require a new employee to be vaccinated as a prerequisite to employment. No problem with that at all. Um, there have been some suggestions that there could be constitutional issues, but I think the better view is that the constitution would not stop an employer saying that for my, for you to come into my place, you have to be vaccinated. And certainly from a contractual employment law point of view, there is absolutely no problem with that. All right. Yvonne, yeah. I noticed you have your hand raised. Is this a separate question that you had from what was in the chat? She's muted. I don't know if she heard her. I'm asking her to unmute. She All says, right. going to deliver a okay. package wherever mm -hmm. is your job and the company is responsible for your... For the costs incurred. Is, are you agreeing that the, comp the employee should not cover the cost for the vaccine as, as, as for the, um, the vaccine test? I, I think that's, that's what, what she's, the point she's, is. That's the point correct. that she's making. Um, if I recall, I think um, um, Yvonne's position was was the same when mm -hmm. we we were here last time. last time. Yes, agreed. Um, Mark Jones was may asking. I, may, may I? May I? May uh, I? May I just clarify? A clarification. Yes. Yes. yes Yvonne. Okay. All right. So good night, everybody. I understand Mr. George's position, but it's not the same. If I work with, with an organization and my job is to deliver a package wherever, it's the company's responsibility to ensure that the costs incurred, whether it be gas or a per diem or whatever, is met by the company. With the vaccine, I am thinking that it cannot be the employee's responsibility to pay for a test which will enable him or her to prove to the organization that they are not infected by COVID. And I just back it up a little bit. So if the organization requires, and I, I'm never for the word mandatory, I think it ought to be replaced with a requirement. So if the organization requires that in order to keep its staff and its environment safe, staff members need to be vaccinated. That's one aspect of it. Someone who refuses or is not quite comfortable at this point in time, because you have to look at everybody's freedom of choice. And some persons are hesitant because they really don't understand how the vaccine works. And some of them have not necessarily a comorbidity, but pre-existing conditions such as allergies that could prevent them from, from taking the vaccine. However, if they are hesitant or if any of these conditions arise, it's their burden to prove to the organization that they are free from COVID. So I'm not in complete agreement that the organization should pay for the cost of the test. If you are at work, if you're at work, sorry, Mr. George, let me just finish. If you're at work, and you're coughing what? and you're showing some sort of symptoms and the organization says to you, okay, I'm not comfortable with those symptoms. You're coughing, you're sneezing, you're doing whatever and you have a high temperature, go get a test. Then the company can give them the money for the tax affair to go or the gas if they didn't have any and the cost of the test. 
I think no, we, sorry, I think we did no Ivan. No Ivan. No Ivan. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry, no Ivan. Because in what that is, case, you know what your case, legal, what is your legal authority for that thesis? I'm not sorry. coming from that position, Mr. George. So to ask me for my legal authority is not that's not the point. The point you is if you if you are gonna be asking the, the, the employer to pay for these tests and the employee has to prove on a regular basis. You know how costly that's gonna be for the employer? I don't agree that the employer should take on that cost. Yeah. Well, so the best position is maybe for the employee to stay home. Who's for us All right, thank Nobody's... you, Ron. We're gonna have the attorney respond. Let me, let me say, as it relates to if you're coughing, if you're sneezing and I'm not comfortable, the law right now is you don't have to be comfortable. If you are showing those symptoms, you must be excluded from the workplace based on the DRM. You are to exclude from the workplace and advise the Ministry of Health. That's the law. You don't take any test for that. You, you have to leave. Now, of course, when it comes on to making sure whether or not you have it or not, and if you have to be treated, that's a totally different affair. But once you are displaying symptoms, the DRM says you must be removed from the workplace and call 1-800-1-LOVE. That's the law. When it comes on to speaking about the employee has to now prove whether or not they are COVID free if the employer goes through that. And I think that's the reason why um, Conrad was saying he is not necessarily a fan of going through this testing process because we get exactly back to the same place. Because if it is that you, you don't get um, agreement either between the employer and the employee or the employee himself to, act, to absorb that cost, you're still right back at the same place in terms of whether or not that person is going to be able to continue in employment. It's an alternative, and I think an alternative which is well worth examining in particular circumstances. But outside of that, um, you know, an employer may very well have to come to that um, walk through the processes to determine whether or not if the employee is saying I am not able to. And in the same vein, in the same vein that it is a high cost to the employer, I, I think the, on, the, on the flip side, it's the exact same concern that an employee may have that is not earning enough to pay for $26,000, $24,000 PCR test every two weeks. So um, I, I do see the alternative. If it is that they are able to find um, accommodation between the parties, I think it's something that should be considered. And in fact, Keith said something that I thought was very important earlier. He said testing for all, because we are aware that it, it can um, be that you have an employee um, who is fully vaccinated that has a breakthrough infection in, in, in those circumstances. But if that alternative to vaccination at this point in time is not something that can be agreed on by the parties, my, my own personal view is the employer may very well have to move to that next stage of determining because if, if you take that as being a reasonable instruction that is not undertaken, you're still back at, at a, a, a consideration as to whether or not termination is in scope. So, so, so Carla, if you walk through the process and you get to, yes, um, I will, me the employer will pay for it, or me the employee in the employee contract will pay for it for my, and I, but I will only pay for antigen tests every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Suppose they get to that place and where that is what's agreed that I am not going to get vaccinated, but I will do an antigen test every two weeks and I'll pay for it myself because I'm not comfortable and, I, and I'm, I'm in a wait and see mode until, until, until I on the, the vaccine, until I'm clear, then I, will, then I will continue to pay for my antigen test until then. And then when I'm comfortable, I will take the vaccine. Yeah, you, you document that, put it on file and go ahead. If, if, if that's what you're comfortable will, with, Keith, everybody, each to their own, I mean, you know, there's, Carla has said it several times. I've said it several times. One size does not fit all. And if, if you have a situation where you as the employer are comfortable with that compromise, 
They're absolutely fine. fine. I, I, my only caveat is that you make sure for your own protection that you document that that you spoke Absolutely. with the employee, the employee is agreeing, and this is the position, and they haven't, you know, had that discussion, they are there, document it and put it on file. I've said many times, there's never a problem until there's a problem. You document that and cover your barrier. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I think Mrs. Duncan Spatch has had her hand Really yes, thank time. you. Yeah. Chloe, I just, is Jason still on? I'm not sure. I don't because see I him. Yes, yeah, he's no. here. He's here. Yeah, the five five persons. So he had separated five persons under the amicable agreement or the consent for separation. Um, what percentage did that represent? Because I, I think we get kind of a little bit fixated on this mandated thing and all of that. Really, it's about the conversation. I want to support Carla and Conrad on that. It really is about it. having the conversation. It's not a large percent of people when you sit down and really reason, 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 reason thing through. So I wanted to find out from Jason that five represented what percent of his of his team? Five out of one twenty-five. Like three so, and a half percent, you know, because we have 125 employees. You hear what I say? So this is We're the point. Guys, and we get, yeah, man, and we get stuck on this thing. Let it go. Just have the conversation with the team members. That is it. You know, we don't have to worry yeah. about 100% because the first target was 65 or 70. I don't know how we reach 100 now as a big problem, right? But I mean, the point is, even in Jason's case, going to 100, it was 2.5%. Want me to say no, Jason? You said more. Five out of 125, which about, I think, mm -hmm. more than. I voted 125. So it's about three and right. a half percent. Yeah. Three and a half. You understand? So, and in yeah. our case, our survey also shows that four percent show that they're not doing it. So, all right. We can live with that. You know, let us go on working through the conversation. Right. That is the well, takeaway, a key takeaway here. No matter worry about the hundred percent or worry about who mandate or whatever, have the conversation. You know, I, I think that's the key, you know. And, and indulge in some serious taxi driving like Jason. Right. <laughs> yeah, man. But my, no. oh my God, no, no. that's what I have to do. The minute he says yes, we just carry him straight down. <laughs> God, Same yeah, time. Straight, straight. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Thank Immediately. You. Thank you, Donna. All right. We have a question in yeah, the man. chat from, from, from Shelly and Joseph. She, wants to, she says that her vaccinated employees are not comfortable and don't want to be around the unvaccinated employees, how do we suggest that she handle that situation in the workplace? That increases and underlines the legal duty that she has mm -hmm. to protect all her employees. And she should use that as part of her discussion with the unvaccinated ones to explain to them that in all reasonableness, which is the key word in all of this, in all reasonableness, they need not to put her other employees at risk and they need to be vaccinated also. All right, and I just want to remind everyone, we will be sending out the guidelines again to everybody who is here this evening. I, I believe a link to the, the guidelines was also shared in the chat so you can click on it and download if you want to go through while we speak. I think Donovan Wignall had his hand raised. Donovan, do you still want to speak? Are you still there? Donovan? You hearing me? You hearing me clearly? Yes, go ahead. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, from the small business point of view, I see several cases where infection shut down businesses and staff and a lot of staff in this area really are vaccine hesitant. While I'm able to get the majority of my staff to agree to the vaccine simply because there are a couple of deaths um, and near misses. I myself had it and had to be at home. A couple of my staff I had to send home everybody and everybody work from home for a period of time because it was in my office. And uh, the whole process brought home the reality 
that you know this is your livelihood and if you get sick and the business has to shut down you have employment you can't pay your rent you can't pay no bills so best believe you better get on board and um, get the vaccine um, to protect your livelihood and to also protect your life but as far as the mandate situation is concerned um, I feel strongly that you can't really enforce the mandate through the back door. We all know that none of the small business people who are the people employed by small business can afford to take to pay for any test, whether PCR or antigen test, at no point in time to keep their job. So therefore, you have to employ what I would call some sort of vaccine diplomacy. I think Donna um, Duncan Scott spoke to it, where you have to engage the staff and you have to really try and sell the idea to them that, you know, this is something that is necessary. Um, you have to do it. If you don't, you're putting the business at risk and hence your livelihood at risk. I think it is very important for us to also and most important for us to lobby for the reduction of the cost of testing. I see absolutely no reason why the cost of testing should be so high. I was in the UK recently and um, there are several people. I was staying at a family member's house. They work with a telecoms company. And every week he gets a test that he does at home. He put whatever on the strip and the two is like a pregnancy test and he sends that back in but it's some it's very cheap i think we can employ the same thing for the people who don't want to be vaccinated and of course it's a no-brainer if you're coming with symptoms in the business you'd go straight home go straight home but definitely at the end of the day um you know if we need to continue on both sides where we try and get our staff to back to be vaccinated on the other side if you can get vaccinated for whatever reason, then you have to do the test to prove to us that you're not sick. Then I think it is important for us to start a lobby to reduce the cost of testing. But if you have people forcing them to go test um, for a test, which then you know that they can't afford, you're really enforcing the mandate through the back door. Um, that's my take on the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, Donovan. I don't know if the attorneys have any comment on that. Okay. I mean, I think we've said it all already in relation to the tests and the cost of tests. There's nothing wrong with tests. It's just a question of requiring an employee to do something and making them pay for it. That's a principle that causes a problem with our law. I think, as I said, I mean, we've, we've ventilated the issues. I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat. I believe Yvonne was this addressed. I think Mrs. Duncan Scott had addressed it when she spoke, but perhaps we can have a, you know, just reiterate a response to can those unvaccinated persons who perhaps don't want to take the vaccine right now, can they work from home? Is that, a, is that an option? Um, Carla, and I'll throw it to you. Um, of course, if it is that they can work from home, we are very much aware that there are many rules. That the person they, said cannot, no. Cannot the be... person said no, Claudine. Read the question above. I was responding to, to that question. They had a number of persons. Some were vaccinated, some were not. Those who were vaccinated were not comfortable working with those persons who were, back, were not. So, so I you're, asked you were those, asking that person. Yes, understood. and the person said no. Right, so they need, you. yes, yes. So you could look at the, the top question. Thank you. All right, great. Okay. Appreciate okay. That. There, All right, we're there was another take... question that was asked earlier about quarantine time. I think we, it wasn't addressed. Yes, I need earlier. it. Somebody asked me and um, I decided to just put it out. What's the question again? Um, oh, the question you... was um, somebody who had traveled overseas had come back into the island. What was the quarantine time and whether the person was required to produce a 
a test, a test result. Well, if the person, my, I have some personal views on this, not so sure what the others think, but if you're going to, you're going on vacation and you are saying that you're taking your vacation and you're going to travel, that is a discussion that should be had with your employer before you leave. That's the first thing. So yes, you can I have agree. your vacation, you can go where you wish, but be prepared that unless, as I understand it now, having traveled to take my son overseas for school, when you get here, if you are vaccinated, you can get a test at the airport, PCR test, you pay for it. If after you pay for it and you get the result and it's negative, we usually come back within 48 hours, you upload that um, result to a website that they give you. At that point, you should be able to go about your lawful business. Right. If you are vaccinated, you don't take the PCR test. I think it's seven days. If you are unvaccinated and... Uh, um, well, I didn't even see if there was any option for unvaccinated people to take the test. That's 14 days. Right. Then she said that they were vaccinated. So this is why I thought. I thought the days. question really was what happens if you come back and have to quarantine and your employer, you don't, you are not able to get back to work. I thought that was more of a question to be answered. And in oh, those no. cases, in those cases, for me, if you do not have that conversation, and you have, you have used up your vacation and you are not able to come back to work, you're going to have to have a conversation now about continuing off with unpaid leave. And yes. what, there's, a, there's okay. a question here that just came through. Would that response cover that as well? If the staff has to quarantine due to an outbreak at home and they can't work from home, is the employer required to pay them or can it be unpaid leave? I know. Well, there would be no a, work, no, no, no work, no pay principle applies. If they have a conversation with their employer, if they are sick, if they themselves are sick and produce their sick certificate, they would be entitled to be on sick leave. That's one. If they are actually ill, but we know that it's, sometimes you are there for a precautionary measure and they are not ill. Mm -hmm. In such a case, then if they have, say, vacation leave to their credit, they can apply to see if that can be approved and they can then continue to be paid. Outside of that, the employer is under no duty to pay them in those circumstances, unless the employer is altruistic and decides to do so of his own accord. There's nothing that is there in law as far as I'm concerned to obligate the employer to pay them. Go back to the early days of when there was the lockdown in St. Catherine and Bull Bay, all of those things. There, even though the government said that, there is no duty in law, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which side you are on, for there to be any payment on those circumstances. It's All just right. the way it is. Okay. I'm very cognizant of the time because we're 12 minutes over the time that we said we would have taken. Um, Gloria has her hand up. I'm going to allow her to ask the question. And then we have one last very brief presentation from Peter Melhedo that we will take. Um, I see, Bridget, I see a question in the chat. I'm going to ask uh, one of the attorneys if possible to respond to her you know a written response in the chat I would appreciate that um, and Gloria I'm going to ask you to ask your question please and then we head to the final segment Gloria um, are you hearing me yes we're hearing you okay um, so at the start of the pandemic um, we got legal advice and we were told that Jamaica has already in place a vaccine mandate, which refers to the 1986 regulations and I see Carla and Harris shaking her head already. Um, and I'm wondering um, to what extent that would give the minister or the government the powers to amend that law, to create any kind of mandate, because there are some people who feel that any kind of vaccine requirement as we are softening the terminology, um, needs to come from the government. And some countries have in fact taken the position that there are requirements for vaccination. So is that a, a facility that is open to the government? Can they use it? Of course they can. The government is the government. The government has been put in place by the people of Jamaica to govern. That is why there is garden house and that is what they're there to do. When it comes on to the public health regulations, 
whoever gave that, I, I think they need to go back to that under the public health that there's the, the um, regulation that speaks to children. I would only add, Carla, that there's that legislation and there's also the DRM, which addresses any crisis in the country of whatever nature that strikes at the health of the nation. And clearly under the DRMA, the government has the power to pass whatever legislation is necessary to keep us safe. Mask mandates, mask requirements are no different in principle to vaccination requirements. Yes, that's correct, correct. And so you know, the government, if it wishes to step up to the plate and, and, and do something, can certainly do so. And, and arguable, some would say, should do something. Oh, yes. So, so Gloria, as far as I am aware, there is no national law that says um, that there is a mandate at, um, for generally, there is this regulation from 1986 under public health that, that speaks to vaccination for children of school age. And even with that regulations, there are exceptions as far as I am aware, I could be wrong. Outside of that, it is the duty of the government having looked at the country and whatever issues that they have to formulate policy and then pass policy into legislating for the benefit and order, good order, and what's a good good government? What's the constitutional term? Peace, order, and good government of the order country. Peace, yeah. and, and that's that's constitutional. And so if they go ahead and pass that law, then it would be. And then it is for the people of Jamaica to decide whether or not they are going to challenge it, as they have done for so many things, like needs for the toll road. That is how democracy works. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we could really discuss this as we learned from the last session. We could go on and on about it, uh, but we have to wrap up. But before we do, I invite uh, Mr. Peter Melhedo, who has been waiting to make his presentation. He is here in this capacity as member of the National COVID-19 Vaccination Operational Task Force, and he will be giving us a brief update on that. So Mr. Melhedo, apologies for the wait, and we invite you to make that presentation for us. Thank you. Peter, you're, you're, you have to unmute him. You're muted, you're muted, Peter. Not seeing him. Well, he's on Safri's, he's on Safri's um, yeah. camera. That's why we're not seeing him. Okay, oh. I, I know somebody <laughs> just had to unmute me, they just did, okay. Um, so folks, thanks um, for the opportunity. Um, I, I fear that this is a very anticlimactic um, summary because um, we have, we're actually kind of in a bit of a, a, a whole pattern. We've, we've submitted a, a number of rec recommendations. As you, as you probably recall, our, our broad mandate was to look at the quality and velocity, my words, um, you know, for, for improving the, the, the national vaccination plan. And since being formed, we have, we have met with a whole host of folks from the opposition, civil society, the private sector, um, and very, very interesting, the teams from other countries who have run very successful vaccination programs. Um, so really our job is to synthesize that data and come up with recommendations um, to, to the prime minister and the ministry um, of health. Um, and so where we are right now is that we are kind of at the point where we, um, we have submitted those um, those proposals and now we're kind of waiting to have some discussions with, with um, both the PM and the ministry to just align on them. But, but they're broadly, if I could say, they're broadly, the needle moving ones are broadly around increasing the velocity of takeup of the vaccine, which is, would be no surprise to everybody on this call. Refocusing on the medically vulnerable. I think, you know, we've gone a bit away from that, um, especially with vac vaccine expiry dates, um, challenging us, et cetera. Um, improving efficiencies in the vaccination process. We currently have a pretty cumbersome process, a costly process. And then um, finally, our last terms of reference is um, item is to implement a digital vaccination certificate. And um, we've made pretty significant headway with that um, and are working within pretty tight timelines around that. So that's kind of you know, you know, broadly where we are. And, and as I said, we're, we're kind of waiting for for some alignment and feedback, and hopefully we will be, um, you know, having some press um, perhaps early next week um, to to kind of you know go through all the various recommendations that we've made. 
So, so that's it from me, really. Thank you. Short and sweet. I hope, <laughs> I hope everyone <laughs> got uh, a takeaway from that. Thank you for that update, Mr. Milhedo. Um, no I know we have many other questions in the chat, but I'm very cognizant of the time, guys. It's late. We all want to get to our normal evening schedule. But I'm going to ask these two questions here from Bridget Hu Sang, who had asked it earlier. If a staff is tested positive, is the company obligated to pay for testing for all the staff? And Mrs. Duncan Scott just posted a question for PSVI. Does the PSOJ have a, or PSVI have a dynamic question and answer for team members that speaks to the various concerns that they have around not taking the vaccine? But I suspect that would be the vaccine, vac acceptance sessions, but I'll allow Safra to answer that. Um, Mr. George, if you could take the pain for the testing if people test positive. Well, I think, I think you have to be um, broad in your, your view of what, what is necessary. It's not a question of who is obligated, whether an employer is obligated. It's a question of what in the circumstances is necessary to protect everybody. So if somebody tests positive, but the surrounding circumstances would not suggest that you have to test everybody in the organization, which may be you know, four or 500 people, uh, then obviously you're not obligated to. But if the circumstances are such that you have four or five people sitting in a confined space in a factory, and one of them tests positive, then you know you really owe a duty to the others as an employer to do everything you can to look after them, including having them tested if they're ill, you know, trying to get the best care for them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a question of just you know somebody automatically being obligated. It really is depending upon the circumstance. I emphasize this area is very practical. There are legal principles, but they're very practical principles, and it all really boils down to reasonableness mm -hmm. in any given set of circumstances. That's the guiding principle that really needs to be applied across. And, and, and just quickly to add to that, Conrad, is that, um, you know, unfortunately COVID is, is sort of like what we call a, a silent killer. The truth is, unless we can narrow down specifically where each person goes from day to day, even though someone may have had um, an, an infection in the office, there's no specific way to tell that this is exactly where it is, unless you are able to narrow down. I went from here to here to here because it, it's so silent. If you left your, your office and went to the supermarket where 50 odd people were and stood in a line in an AC, it is possible that that's where the infection came from. So you can't Absolutely. specifically say that it, it, it has to be there and that therein lies the issue. Uh, what, what, what we call um, in, in law causation, really. Yeah. I see a question here for Peter from Graham, but Graham, I think he left already. Um, final question. Serious this time from Jackie. My customer, my worker has to work at the customer's premises. The customer state that the per, that they should not come on their persons who are not vaccinated should not come on their premises. The person can therefore not work. What can they do? What can she that, do? That calls in that brings in not just the law of employment, but mm -hmm. the right of owner of premises to dictate who comes onto those premises. And if, if you have a merchandiser, which is what I presume the question is referring to, who works at an establishment, a supermarket or what have you, and the supermarket says, no, no, no contractor or, or worker can come in here who is not vaccinated, then you have no way of forcing that person to go there. And that person has no way of forcing you to employ them to do nothing. So if there is nothing else that that person can do, there's a good argument that that person's position is redundant insofar as the circumstances have panned out because the, the, the supermarket where they work will not accept them. I think we've come full circle to the, the guidelines which you would have gone through step by step early and sharing with everyone. Um, like I said earlier, 
we will be sending it out to everybody who's on the call and the link is also in the chat for those who want to access it now. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Keith to do the final, the conclusion, the summary, and I bid everybody a good night after that. Keith? Yeah, Cloning, thank you for moderating the session um, very well. Thank you very much. Um, um, Conrad Carlo, Mr. Distant, who led that process of pulling all the stakeholders together to come up with these protocols around how to approach it in the workplace, how to develop that policy, how to get to or how to get to that conclusion inside the workplace. This is still very much evolving, and you know there will be different ways and means of, as you said, there is no one size fit all kind of approach. So, but the work is appreciated. The protocols make sense. They will take you to a solution. And, um, you know, so we really want us to, we really want to add value to our members and the wider private sector organizations in Jamaica to get them the protocols in a very simple way, step by step, you know what I mean, such that they can be guided and, you know, at least have some clarity around how to treat with this, the questions of, of COVID and vaccines in the workplace. You know, so this is just a value added activity that we're doing, but we really want to get it out. And so therefore, for all who are in attendance, if they can share with um, with friends, colleagues, other business associates and give them the guidance, we're going to try and um, break it down a little bit. I'm asking Mega to see how we can break it down so we can just get the step by step piece so people can say, OK, this is this is just let me just follow this process. And, um, I'll be, and I'll be covered and I'll be protected. And it removes some of the noise that is out there, you know? So that is critical in terms of the private sector vaccine initiative, we continue. And, um, you know, acknowledging Chris, Peter, Safri, Colando, and the entire team. And, um, you know, the PSOJ team that provide good support, excellent support to the PSVI team. You know, I think we have Jerome Miles online who is, um, who works hard from the JMEA in this effort also, and um, to really um, with the practice and the PSVI initiative. And I believe we're making an impact, but we 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 are we are we are we are we are adjusting and modifying our strategies as the circumstances change and as we want to get more targeted in our approach. But what we know is that we are in for a long haul, and we have to take it vaccine by vaccine, jab by jab, working, engaging, talking heart to heart, and also working through the protocols and the solutions. So I just want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you for your time. And we continue to engage the task force, and we continue to engage the polit our leaders in, in the political sphere, both the prime minister and the leader of opposition, trying to pull it together to so, let, so that this can be depoliticized it's a national crisis we have. We came together our own economic reform program as a country that we agreed on what an economic reform program looked like. We must can agree on what our vaccine strategy is like that can return us to some, some level of normalcy. I was just in Canada recently, and um, you know we're, they're 80% vaccinated and they are back to normal. Back to normal. Like, you know, they, they may have some, um, you know, in terms of gathering restrictions and how much people can be in a movie theater and they will have their safe zones and they will have their vaccine passport. But it, but life is um, living with COVID with a high degree of normalcy. That's what I would say. At, um, countries that have vaccinated have been able to um, achieve. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Imega, for, pull, for pulling this together and, and, and putting up with me on this. and. Um, Everyone have a great evening.